Stephen Kim and Robert McGaffin shared a vision for capturing the best in automotive craftsmanship. What you are seeing in the magazines that are you know, three to five page features, you're only seeing 1% of what these cars are all about. And these cars are so incredibly well built. All we were trying to do just to present the cars in a way that does justice to the cars. The pages of Wheelhub almost feel sacred. Born in an age when many say print is dead, Stephen Kim and Robert McGaffin's Wheelhub brought a sense of awe back to automotive journalism. Every image is stuffed to the corners with detail. Every feature car is a masterpiece. Today we're talking with Wheelhub founders Stephen Kim and Robert McGaffin about capturing excellence, automotive journalism, and what it takes to see a vision through to the end. Being an automotive journalist is kind of a dream job for a lot of people. You know, me as a kid looking at Gray Baskerville and David Freiberger, it's like, man, these guys have got it made. You know, how did you, how did you get started doing that? I'm the only guy in my family that for some reason likes cars. So, uh, you know, back in the 80s and 90s before the internet, there was really, unless you had someone to kind of show you the ropes or had someone's garage you could hang out. My only connection to any of that was through magazines. You know, there, there was no internet, there were no car TV shows. So that's what I did. It's like any magazine I could get my hands on, that was my only exposure to the hobby until I got old enough to buy my own cars. So, you know, I was always a very avid reader, just kind of sounds like you were as well. Um, and so it just, as I was going through school, trying to figure out, hey, what do I want, what do I want to do with my life? It just seemed like a, a natural fit. Pretty early on that I actually kind of enjoyed writing and had an affinity for it. And, you know, my English teachers in high school kind of encouraged me to do it. Went to school, got my uh, journalism degree. And as I was approaching the end, I, I had the really good fortune of having some good mentors in college who kind of helped me prepare a uh, really good, really good cover letter that was both succinct and kind of encapsulated my journey and sent that out. And uh, luckily enough, I got a hit from Prime Media and that kind of led to an uh, internship at Hot Rod. Did that for a little bit for minimum wage and that turned into a staff position. And that's a funny story too, because I got really lucky. I go in for the interview at Prime Media, I'm meeting with the HR lady and she set me up to talk to Jeff Smith, who at the time was editor of Chevy High Performance. So I'm sitting there waiting around for 30, 45 minutes, and evidently Jeff completely forgot about the interview. So I was supposed to talk to him, <laughs> uh, anyone there, and this HR lady is like, well, this poor guy, who am I going to talk to? So she's like, I know, I'll call up David Freiberger at Hot Rod. And so it just turns out that there was an associate editor position vacancy there. The position was frozen for a while, and he had just unfrozen the position, and uh, it's kind of funny. He, she, she calls a Freiberger and he tells me the story he, he, where she's like, well, I got this guy. He came in to talk to Jeff Smith and or the internship program that we've got. And I can't get a hold of Jeff. Will you talk to him? And he said, sure, send him on up. So, <laughs> uh, so I talked to him and uh, that, that's how I got my foot in the door. You know? and, and, you know, as much as I like to tell people, yeah, I ended up on Hot Rod because you know, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. That wasn't the case. I just got lucky. Jeff wasn't there, and Freiburger was willing to talk to me, and that's how I ended up there. Just dumb luck. Well, but then obviously you had to prove your chops to stay on staff for a while, right? Yeah. So you know, I um, you know worked there for a couple years, and uh, um, it was really interesting because it was uh, you know when you're looking to get into it, you'd be happy just to get your foot in the door anywhere, you know, even if it's one of the uh, the smallest titles. Uh, the interesting thing about it is. You know, it was kind of two crash courses simultaneously. It was kind of learning the business, learning how to produce content, but at the same time, getting a, a crash course on corporate politics and, and uh, being exposed to a lot of stuff you don't necessarily want to see. So, uh, you know, it, unfortunately, the downside of that was I figured out that, you know, as much as I loved the job, I didn't want to stick around. And so that's how, you know, the story kind of takes the next turn when, you know, met Robert and started working and so, you know, as, as I'm freelancing, I did that probably, let me see here, 2005 to until we started, first started getting it going. And throughout the process, you know, me and Robert, we'd always end up getting paired together. He was the best photographer they can find. So they'd have him shoot everything. 
and he would he'd get matched with me. I, I'd write a lot of the stories for the cars that he'd shot. So that's how we met, and that's how we started working together. And Robert, as you know, he really changed the face of photography in, in a lot of ways for the industry. I mean, he, he had a very different background than a lot of automotive photographers. Uh, you know, he shot commercially for almost his entire career. So he kind of brought that kind of focus and intensity and attention to detail that uh, you you very rarely see in editorial photography on the automotive side. So that definitely caught my eye and caught the eye of all the editors. And that's how, you know, he, he started shooting covers for all of them. There were times when he had a half a dozen covers or more on the newsstand at the same time. So it was a uh, Really great to work with him, get to know him and kind of learn a lot from him on, in, on the photography end. The longer we started doing it, and it just became more difficult to uh, continue freelancing. So, yeah, you know, one day I just kind of pitched the idea to Robert, hey, we should just do our own magazine. You know, we can, uh, you know, the editors we work for, they could hire any photographer they want, they can hire any writer they want, but, but well, you know, we get paired up all the time. So there's got to be a reason for that. Well, let's let's just give it a try and, and, and see what happens. So that's kind of how we love started. And how long ago was that? Oh, we first started talking about it, I want to say 2015, 16. And then it was around early 2017 when, when we got pretty serious about uh, putting some content together um, and going out and rounding up advertisers. Early 2017, we decided, hey, you know, we, we've, here we've got this idea to get this magazine off the ground. A uh, million dollar question is how do you pay for it? Because we don't have the money. So we decided, hey, why don't we just take some content that we've already got and put together a prototype or a beta copy? So we uh, went, went through our hard drives, picked out half a dozen cars um, that we wanted to uh, have in our uh, test copy, our prototype. The only problem was we had no, we didn't know um, who was going to lay it out and do the graphic design work. It was, because at that point, all we had, we had some killer images, uh, we had some text we could plug in, but we had no clue who we were going to use as an art director. So um, we went back and forth with that. We got some quotes from guys that we wanted to use where we could never afford to use. And how we got hooked up with Rodney, who unfortunately couldn't join us for the podcast, but uh, you know, I had worked with Rodney somewhat indirectly. You know, I was out at a shop here locally in Houston um, doing some product photography for them, and they wanted to put together a flyer or a handout to, to take the good guy shows to sell their products. And so I did the photography and the text for him. And I asked him, hey, who's going to actually do the graphic design? He's like, well, my buddy Rodney will do it. And he, he does all our t-shirts. And uh, he showed me some of his work. And I was always impressed with what he could do. And he did an, an amazing job on these little handouts. That, and you know, he, he knows what parts of the car and the chassis are whatnot are relevant. I, I like how he's laying everything out. You know, he, he, he obviously, knows, he's, he's got an eye for how this should all look from the, uh, but the main thing was it looked very different from anything you typically see. So I'm gonna give Rodney a call. So I called him out of nowhere. He, he remembered the thing he worked on. Well, I, I'd never done a magazine before, but, and I was like, hey, that's, that's perfect. We, that's what we want. We want a completely different perspective on how things have been done before. And we don't want to approach things from, hey, here's a, your typical magazine layout. Um, what can we, remove to make it cleaner and more minimalist we want to start with a clean slate we want we start with a, a clean slate and just add the bare minimum of what we think is necessary to, to, to get the message across and really present the cars how they should be uh, because when we first i first post the uh uh concept to him and said hey look we're gonna have this magazine it's not gonna have any tech articles it's gonna be all features and and they're gonna be 20 at least 20 pages each you know he he, he asked me who, who on earth is gonna look at a car for 20 pages that was his first question the second question was how would you even fill it with 20 pages um so i handed him a thumb drive that had the images you want to use and then you know, to hear him tell the story he went from asking hey how are we going to fill 20 pages to how are we going to possibly make all this fit 
in 20 pages mm. for a story that's just so much great great content which is what i was trying to communicate to them is look what you are seeing in the magazines that are you know, three to five page features you're only seeing one percent of what these cars are all about and th these cars are so incredibly well built and detailed it's a shame that no one can actually appreciate them for what they are unless you're one of the lucky few like us who actually gets to get up close to these cars and sit in them and look under the hood and put them on the lift and look underneath them most people don't have that luxury even if you have it at it if, even if you see the car at a show because it's going to be roped off with a million people around it they're certainly not going to let you sit in it so all all we were trying to do and this is still the, the main objective of wheel hub is just to present the cars in a way that does justice to the cars. I mean, the we're just trying to, to show them for what they're worth because, you know, we, uh, for the longest time, the, the cars kept getting better and better. Year over year, the, uh, the level that the quality and the detail and the overall fabrication that, that the builders are putting into these cars and the, and, and the level that they're improving year over year is phenomenal. Yet the their coverage in the media is getting worse. They got had this delta. The cars are getting better. The coverage are getting worse. And, right. And that that's really a shame. I mean, to, to keep this thing going, to keep people interested, excited about cars, keep for people to continue spending spending money on cars, whether they're building it themselves or buying parts or taking it to the shop. We need to keep that level of excitement up. And, and the best way to do that is to present the cars in, in a way where people can really appreciate them. And that's all we're trying to do is, is just show the cars for what they are and keep people excited so people keep building cars. And we, we can continue to uh, make a living without any real jobs. So that's <laughs> whether, whether we're, we're doing a wheel hub or doing a podcast or you're an aftermarket max manufacturer or a racer or a fabricator or a painter. None of us want real jobs. We want to keep building cars or keep enjoying cars. And so we're yeah. just, uh, all we're trying to do is, is, is uh, you know, contribute in whatever way we can. So we, we, we can keep that rolling. I want to back up a bit. So <laughs> Robert, you didn't start shooting cars. You, you were, you started just as a photographer without cars in the equation, right? And then how did how did the car thing come about? Um, I've always been into cars. So as a kid, I was into cameras. I was into cars. Um, I used to build models all the time. And then I remember when I was in grade school, it was probably about eight or sometime between eight and 10 years old, my parents got me an Instamatic. And um, one year for Christmas, I got a like a Polaroid Kodak version of a Polaroid camera. And so I used to take my models and then take them outside and put them in environments and photograph them and stuff like that. So I've always had Hot Wheels or I've always had models or something like that. I've always been interested in cars. Um, and photography was always something I kept going back to. And when I got serious about it in high school, um, I came across a friend of mine used to work for local Montgomery Wards when I was living in Illinois. And he had a, he worked in the returns department and this little S, um, SLR came in with some lenses and stuff and it was pretty cheap. So I went and hadn't bought it. And that's just kind of like started the whole journey for me photography wise. So post high school, I went to school for photography and art. And um, my goal was to shoot, you know, killer commercial stuff in Chicago or wherever. And that I did that for probably 10, 12 years. I was doing that. Um, started out as an assistant, did that for five years, and then finally started getting jobs in photo studios. And a lot of the same reasons Stephen said that, you know, he wanted to get out of the corporate. I was in a corporate position a couple of times and it was just awful and I wanted out. And, um, but my corporate career ended not by my own choice. Um, right before I lost my last job, I was laid off and I had already started doing some stuff with magazines because a couple of years prior to that, like in 2016, I think it was, um, Popular Hot Writing started doing photo contests. And the first year I wanted, and I found out about it, I wanted to enter and I couldn't because 
the editor had set the rules up. You had to own the car. Well, I didn't have a car. And so I waited till next year and next year came up and they changed the rules where you didn't have to own the car. So I had seen this little Nova at, at a local cruise night a couple of times. So I just would keep going there until the guy showed up and um, talked to him, told him what I was doing. He was all into it. So we went a couple, like one next week later on a weekend, I went out and shot his car for a couple of days, just to make sure I got what I wanted and turned it in and ended up winning. Um, and that's how I got my foot in the door through PHR. And um, about two weeks after the magazine came out, um, I had sent a letter to Johnny Hunkins, who was the editor at the time, and just kind of thanking him and say, hey, I do photography full time, but I'm always looking for something else to do in the car world. You know, if you ever need freelance help, let me know. And um, I sent it snail mail. And then a few weeks later, he get I get this phone call at work and I lock my doors to my studio and I'm talking to him for about three hours about stuff. And um, so I was living in Northern Illinois, just North of Chicago a little bit. And it was November when he sent me my first assignment. So we had luckily had a weekend where we had Indian summer, if you will. And I was able to, he had a photo contest or uh, engine contest that the guy locally had won. So he had me go out and shoot that car. And then I shot another car about a month later. And then um, shortly after that, he had invited me out to, at the time it was called Mopars at the Strip. So it was kind of a way for him to give me like a boot camp of kind of what they, what he expects and what they look for, for in terms of the type of photography and what to shoot and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went out there on my own dime and kind of spent the weekend with him going through all that and came home. And then it wasn't, probably was, um, later that was, that was the beginning of 20, 2007, I think it was. And I started doing a little bit here, a little bit there for him. And then, um, right at the beginning of, yeah, it was right at the beginning of 2008. Um, my company let me go or I lost my, they had laid off a bunch of people and I was one of them got affected. I was running a photo studio for gift and collectibles company at the time. And so I was talking to him talking to my ex-wife at the time or she's my wife at the time and just like I'm just going to go for it and see what happens my goal was to just do the freelance stuff for the magazines at least for popular hiring at the time and hopefully that would grow into something and did that for um, started doing that for about a year and the first year I was freelancing I had, was out in Arizona um, working with another gentleman who had won the next contest and we were, Johnny wanted me to train him for being his Southwestern kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And somehow on that trip, I had broken my foot and I had the first day I was there practically. And so um, I was laid up for the rest of the winter and that's Steve and I had, had been talking quite a bit at that point. And we just kind of talked even more. And um, I remember one day I was laying on the couch with my foot elevated and I get this email from Johnny and he sends me the shot that Steven had just done where we used to do a lot of rig shots mm -hmm. where you mount this contraption to the car and kind of do a long exposure to make it look like it's driving really fast when it's literally just rolling like somebody's mm -hmm. pushing it. And Steven had done one where the guy was doing a burnout and doing the rig shot at the same time. So then I start, I called him up and we start chatting about it. And I think for even from that point on, I think we talked probably two, three times a month, just about random stuff and stories and whatnot. Um, and fast forward about six years later, <laughs> we've been friends for five or six years at this point. And then, then like he came up to Wisconsin once to come do a photo shoot and I had him hang out the weekend with me. And that was like the first time we actually met face to face mm -hmm. in five years of <laughs> friendship and stuff. But um, yeah, I just, when I started with PHR, it kind of just, other editors started taking note and started bringing me in the fold. And before I knew it, I was basically shooting for all the titles. Um, it's like, in, what was it? Uh, there was one year right before there was a big shakeup in the company. They were getting ready to change names again and new, new buyers or whatever. And I had nine covers at once on the, on the <laughs> stands, which was kind of interesting. That was, that was a big deal. Um, I was pretty proud of that. And uh, yeah, and then when Stephen came to me about this, about Wheelhub, 
at the time we didn't know what it was. Um, I was just all in because um, I was kind of getting a little, starting to get a little burnout, out, constantly doing the same, you know, I was doing, you know, a lot of the same sh- kind of cars all the time. I wasn't, um, they kept wanting more and more and more for me. And I wanted to not dilute myself, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, it was actually at a point where I was actually starting to look for a real job again. And this is, you know, 10 years after I've been freelancing and freelancing is only supposed to last, you know, temporarily, you know, right. It's a decade. So, um, right when, and it was like 2017, I had really gotten like the summer before I had really gotten burnout. And I was just to a point where all right, I need to make a change in my life. Something's got to happen. I can't keep doing this. And, and I was just on the road constantly. And I kind of wanted to stay at home a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I just gotten remarried and stuff and I didn't, you know, I just wanted to have more of a stable life, if you will. And so Steve and I started, we had talked about the magazine a couple years prior to that. And I called him up one day, like first quarter of 17, you know, let's get this thing going. And um, we had talked to another designer and sent him some, we sent him some images and had him just do a layout and just to see if that's the direction we wanted to go. And then something, they fall off, fell off the, fell off the grid for a while. We don't really know what happened. And then um, in that time frame, Stephen had met Rodney and things had just kind of fell into place at that point. It was like, we went from, okay, let's see what we're going to do to, I think within from, we started talking about it in March. I think we met Rodney in what, May? Was that May or April? Yeah, April, May sounds about April, right. April, May like that. And then by, what was it, by the end of summer, we had the beta put together and we were talking to shops and potential advertisers in August and September and November or yeah, from November, we had beta copy and went to semen with it and just kind of, and in December I was shooting, finally shooting the rest of my full features for the first issue that was coming up in, in January. So it was the first one just kind of went quick and then um, got it together and we've had some really good partnerships. Um, I'd have to, Honestly, I have to thank Eric Peratt from Pinky's Hot Rods, who really gave us a good pull at the beginning. Um, he and Rodney are really good friends. They've been t- they've been known each other for over twenty years. And mm-hmm. um, Eric wasn't utilizing his whole booth at Pomona the first year we launched, and he offered us a section of his booth to help launch the magazine, which is right in the middle of Building Four at Pomona. So you couldn't have been mm-hmm. in a better spot. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and it people were starting to really like it and and it was <laughs> it was one of those things where you know you, you he and I drove down to or flew down to Houston and Stephen and I drove a truck of a pallet full of magazines to Pomona um we drove 24 hours straight to get there to unload <laughs> and um if we get to the show and by the end by Saturday night I'm like you know just trying to take it all in and you know the the response we got and um everything it was just kind of overwhelming and kind of dreamlike in a way and then it was funny by Saturday night I went I got to do this again <laughs> and keep feeding that beast and it's just like you forget that at times that you know that it's you got to keep feeding that beast and so yeah. it's just been it's been good but I really wanted to take the look of the book to a point where I mean I was trying to push the envelope in terms of what how typical editorial is done um introducing, you know, different compositions and different techniques and stuff. And it got to a point where I couldn't do that anymore because it was just, there was so much demand on getting stuff done mm-hmm. and I couldn't take the time that I wanted. And I was watching some of my other peers do things that, you know, I knew I could do. I just didn't have the time to do it. And I kind of wanted to, you know, grow a little bit more. And I wanted to take an opportunity. We wanted to give this book a commercial automotive look instead of an editorial look, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, I think we've achieved that quite well. Um, I've been having a lot of fun, you know, working with the shops now. I mean, I always had fun with a lot of shops I work with, but just I'm getting more and more excited about doing the job. Um, mm-hmm. Then I, like I said, you're going to get doing kind of repetitive stuff and you have to do it in a short time frame, and you may have to skirt, quality issues a little bit just to get it done and I didn't want to have that suffer anymore 
I wanted to do the art that I wanted to do and, um, and surround myself with other, you know, other photographers, other peers that we have that we bring into the magazine occasionally to mm -hmm. do, you know, that kind of level of work we wanted. So, um, yeah, Admiral, it's been an interesting journey and it's, hopefully it's, you know, it keeps growing every day. So it's always a good thing. Steven found himself wanting more. In his mind, if a new generation was going to fall in love with cars, they needed a visceral experience to teach them the craftsmanship and the artistry of a great car. That desire put Steven on the path to make something that seemed crazy to his peers. 20 pages dedicated to one car? Yes, because that's what it takes to do a great build justice. Do you guys remember, was there like a moment when you held the first printed issue in your hands? Do you remember what, what that felt like? Uh, it's pretty surreal for me. Um, even the Beto, when I saw that for the first time, I was just blown away. Like, um, we didn't shoot anything in the way we shoot it now for that. We just used existing art that we had. And even that was like, it looks so much different than how it had been presented before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, it was pretty exciting to see that. And then, yeah, when the first issue came out, I was, I was blown away. Um, and I'm always like eagerly waiting my box of magazines to come from the printer because <laughs> mm -hmm. everyone is a new adventure, but it's, um, yeah, they, they keep getting better and better. So. Yeah. And to, to follow up with what Robert said, yeah, when we first got the, uh, the box of prototypes, we printed up about a hundred of them and, you know, we put together a cover letter and we sent them out to who we felt would be a good fit either as advertisers or sponsors, that's when it started feeling pretty real. Uh, but at the same time, we hadn't done anything to, to uh, work towards getting the first issue produced, mm -hmm. as, as Robert mentioned. So from the time we, we printed or we got the printed beta, I want to say that was around August of 2017, all the way up until um, the first issue went to the printer, which was in early January, we were on the phone nonstop just uh, following up with anyone and everyone who had seen the prototype and ad contracts and website, e-commerce, like all on the fly. And we've done none of this stuff before. Uh, we, we didn't even know what was involved with actually setting up a company on paper. So we're learning all this on the fly while we're also trying to round up advertising while we're also trying to put the content mm -hmm. together all within the course of a few months. Um, so it's miraculous. We even got it done. I mean, that, that's the crazy part when we look back at it because, um, there was so much that was done in such a condensed timeline that we had never done before. We were just too dumb to know any better. But I remember when we first had the digital file for all the stories and ads compiled, that was kind of like an aha moment because we'd seen all the stories individually. We'd seen mm -hmm. the ads individually, but once it was all compiled together, we're going through 164 pages uh, of what we just compiled. Then, you know, Ronnie put it as this visual overload. It's like, my goodness. You know, I told him all along, when people pick this thing up, we, we just need to beat them over the head with great content, just page after page, mm -hmm. where, where you just want people to be overwhelmed. Um, and so that's what it was like before it was even printed. So to go from that to now it's actually coming off the printer. Um, again, that's it started feeling pretty real then, but there's nothing like getting and you know, having the truck show up and it drops off seven or eight pallets. And, and for the first thought is, well, how on earth are we going to get rid of these? And, <laughs> and the second thought is, you know, once you open it up, then you're like, wow, this has um, come a long way in a very short amount of time. Now we just got to go out and sell these things. Uh, but the, um, you know, as they say, it, it's uh, one thing after another, everything, you could have possibly imagined that could have gone wrong, did gone wrong. Like when, when Robert, he mentioned we, we drove 24 hours straight. The reason we had to do that was, you know, we printed this thing in the middle of the winter, but we, we had um, we had ice storms that delayed the process. So we had these bad ice storms. And when we get ice here, no one doesn't drive. So I think it's delivered. <laughs> so, you know, our, our the paper we needed um, was late. A lot of what we needed for our, our booth in Pomona, that was a delay. In hindsight, 
it all worked out great. And there were all these hiccups along the way, but um, by making a coming out and announcing, Hey, we're going to launch a Pomona. Now, not only are we having to get a magazine off the ground, a business off the ground, now we got to figure out, okay, well now we got to, how we're going to, how and what we were going to set up. So all of this is kind of coming together at the same time. So the paper's delayed, uh, the printing is delayed. Um, a lot of the materials and supplies we need to set up our booth are delayed. And, um, you know, we had to be in Pomona on a Wednesday evening to set up. Me and Robert, we were picking the magazines up at the printer on the way out there. And we had to drive 24 hours straight. In addition to all the other delays caused by weather, we had some issues at the printer with their binding equipment breaking and setting things back. So it was really nip and tough. I mean, we literally, we had to drive 24 hours straight and, you know, we, the magazines were literally hot off the truck. As soon as they were boxed up, we showed up with their truck and then loaded us up and we left. So, so all that considered, it, it's miraculous that we even made it. Um, so, so there was a, for me, there's a lot of distractions, you know, there, there should be that moments where you're holding it in your hand and going, wow, look, 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 look what we've done, but there was just so much going on. I didn't even really have time to think about that until much later. Yeah. So, so, so it was a, uh, you know, quite, quite an experience to say the least. The magazine, I mean, to, to someone who hasn't seen it, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's thick, the features are huge, like you mm-hmm. mentioned, you know, every car kind of gets the the space that it deserves mm-hmm. to sort of match the ambition that went into the car build sure. sort of goes mm-hmm. into the feature that of the car. I mean, that has to take a lot of work and a lot of discipline to do mm-hmm. issue after issue after issue. I mean, talk about that. How, how do you do that? Well, first of all, I can go back a little bit. So in terms of what we try to show in the magazine, Rodney's vision um, for the features and how he lays them out is to see all 360 degrees of the car so you can get the full car experience. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember one of the stories, uh, one of the first stories we did in the, I think it was in issue one, I, we'd gotten some feedback on social media that somebody had gone to the show and saw one of the Roadster Shop cars that we had in the first issue. And when they saw it in the magazine, they saw things in the magazine they couldn't see at the show because, you know, again, it was kind of, you know, people around it all the time. They couldn't spend that much time mm-hmm. in it, but then they were able to see details in our book that they didn't even see when they saw it in person. So to me, that told me right there that we were doing, we we're on the right track. Um, I, you know, we scour, I scour the internet, um, social media, look at builders, new builders. Um, I'll talk to the builders. I normally see I'm, in i'm in wisconsin so i'm like just a little bit north of the chicagoland area so i've got i'm only like ring brothers are literally the next county over for me i rad rides is about three hours away roadster shops about two hours away and there's a bunch of other shops in illinois and iowa and i'm three hours away from eddie's ride and custom um so i've got a pretty pretty well located area where i can just kind of get in a car and go see people if i need to and see what the shops are up to and um so between that and then Rodney also has his group of um, builders that he's been, he knows of, and he'll pitch us, I, you know, we'll pitch each other ideas and we'll shoot texts or DM each other on social media and just trying to f- compile things to put together. And um, I think that's majority how we find most of the features we do or just go to the shows and see stuff too. I've noticed that the cars in the, the, in, in the magazine well in the magazines now and we'll get to that in a minute but they're all cars that i want to see even though it might not be a super logical leap from a jag xke to a traditional hot rod roadster mm-hmm. you know to a mercedes like it they're they're all over the place but they're all cars that are that i want to see more of you know well, we I forgot mean, the, you forgot the ship and the bikes <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, yeah we had we had a, a high-end yacht and you know motorcycles in there um you know the it's it, interesting you mentioned that because it, having freelance for so many years um, i always felt like the all the different niches there are were artificial in some ways meaning some, someone decided well you, you can't have um a jaguar or a Beetle or a Lamborghini Miura 
in the same magazine as the 69 Camaro or the Ricky Ford. You know, no one's going to be interested in that. Those Each one of those types of cars is its own niche. So they went out and started new magazines for all of them. Uh, yeah, it, it that's for me personally, uh, not just what I like, but what my friends like and what other builders like. It, it very often wasn't like that. It, you had people that appreciated a little bit of everything. And so, you know, I, I just thought, why make someone go out and buy five or six magazines? Why can't we just have the best of the best in, in one place? And you might not like all of them, but, you know, a, as we started doing that, you know, the interesting thing is you're always told uh, working for the big club publishing companies that, hey, that will never work. You know, you, you put a Lamborghini Miura in a magazine that has the 32 Fords in it, and you're, you're going to get so much backlash. That's stupid. You can't do it. Well, we've actually seen the exact opposite. It's the, the stories people talk about the most that keep coming up are the ones that kind of fall outside your traditional hot rod or, or muscle car uh, or custom. And that's that's what that's what's memorable to people. That's what resonates with people. And um, you know, the, uh, I've had this conversation many times with, uh, with builders, like, hey, you know, it, uh, actually a uh, specific conversation with Alan Johnson I had comes to mind. I was doing a story on his uh, 3240 built that was an NSRA giveaway car. And he's like, you know what? I, I might, I'm a, I love 32 Fords. I love hot rods. But, you know, I also love VWs. I love Porsches. Um, I love the 356 Porsches that you did. And he's all, you, as a builder or a car guy, you should like those things because they might be different, but they're all, they're ultimately, they're cars, they're hot rods, and they're all places you can pull different ideas from. And he's not, he, he's one of dozens of different builders who told me the same thing. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, on the one hand, it, it seems um, that the, the variety of content uh, is so outside the box that it might not work. And people aren't used to seeing that. But on the other hand, it's, uh, you know, people seem to really, really enjoy it. And, and, you know, now that we've done it for uh, a number of years now, we, no, we don't even think twice. It's like, okay, uh, Robert tells me, oh, Jesse Green just built this cool bike. Okay, go, go, go shoot it. There, there's not even any, any hesitation now because we know that it will be appreciated. And that, that bike's a great example. Here, here's the guy building hot rods and muscle cars who's one to two Riddlers, but here he builds this really cool cafe racer bike just for his own personal use. And you know, it's got the same level of quality and attention to detail as a car he built, cars he, he's building. So why not? That's a new brainer. When we come back, Stephen and Robert talk about what it takes to keep raising the bar with every issue. But first, to see photos of Stephen, Robert, and their game-changing magazine, visit The Toolbox, our automotive blog, Find it at SpeedwayMotors.com and click the Toolbox link on the front page. We'll also post a few photos to Facebook and Instagram. New episodes of What Moves You come out every two weeks on Tuesdays. If you like what you hear, tell a friend to listen to What Moves You on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. This seems like a good time to mention then, you know, it's not just Wheel Hub anymore. Uh, you've grown out to now four books, right? Chevy Hub, Mustang yes. Hub, <laughs> Truck yeah. Hub, and Wheel Hub. Yes. How, how did that come to be? How, how did that branching out come about? As Truck Hub was going together and, um, you know, we, we decided to go in that direction probably in early February. You know, we, we were, uh, hadn't quite yet decided what the second magazine would be as of the Grand National Roaster Show uh, in 2000. 20. So we get back from the show um, and we kind of reached consensus. Okay, let's do a truck magazine. Um, as all this was happening, actually prior to this happening, there's a lot of turmoil uh, back at Motor Trend. And as of uh, middle to late December of 2019, 19 titles are going away. And uh, best of luck to you. So uh, it was just terrible for the industry. It's terrible for us to see because we I grew up reading those titles just like everyone else. We were big fans of them. We worked for them. So um, no one wants to see that. And so you had a lot of good people, uh, a lot of talent out there who were, who was all of a sudden they're on the market. They're available. The, the, and these discussions um, were happening with Henry uh, before 
we'd even decided to do for a cut. So kind of simultaneously, while well, internally, we're trying to figure out, hey, what's, what's the next best direction to go in with our second title? We're having already having these conversations with Henry De Los Santos. Henry and I uh, worked together uh, back when Motor Trend was owned by Prime Media. So this is back in the early 2000s, and he was working on car craft at the time. And then I had just gotten hired at Hot Rod, and we were both kind of young guys kept working up, come, coming through the ranks, and uh, you know we've been friends ever since. So uh, I worked with Henry a lot when he was on Chevy I Performance. I did a lot of freelance work for him, and then uh, you know did a little bit when he was on the Mustang magazine, but not a lot. So um, you know it was really nice to have that opportunity to reconnect. So as, as you know, I'm talking to Henry, um, you know in the late part of December, early January, you know, he, he had other opportunities that he was weighing and ultimately he decided, let me, let me, uh, come aboard and work with you guys. And then, uh, you know, so we kind of went through the same thing we did internally with wheel hub, where we're trying to decide, well, what's the next most logical direction to go in, uh, as far as, a title that we bring into the uh, hub family uh, but Henry you know he came to me and said you know let, let's do a Mustang magazine and that wasn't my first choice at first I wasn't crazy about it but you know his, his reasoning behind it was look I've been hot and heavy in the Mustang market the last four or five years and it would be a really natural transition for me I'm already working with you know a bunch of uh a bunch of staff guys and freelancers who I can bring on over who are very well known in this space. They're passionate about this space. And so, um, you know, I was told, I was like, hey, you know what? If, um, you know, like any partnership, it's, it, it's going to be a give and take. It's, it's not just about what I want to do. It's, it's his baby too. So um, that's how we decided to uh, jump into the Mustang market. And uh, really in, in that space, the, uh, the two big brands for decades have been Muscle Mustangs and Fast Fords, which I was a huge fan of growing up, and also 5.0 Mustang and Super Fords. And both of those unfortunately went away. So um, we wanted to kind of fill that void and, you know, as we learned um, right away is the response was phenomenal. I was very, very pleasantly surprised. You know, the, the, uh, it, it's a smaller niche, but it's similar, similar to the Mopar market in that um, what, what it lacks for in sheer size, these the Mustang guys are just fanatical. They are absolutely fanatical. You know, you, you give them a product, a quality product, that is targeted toward them that they appreciate and, and they'll back you until the end of time. So um, it was just a, uh, it worked out great. And you know, from the very beginning, the response to the Mustang market was phenomenal. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's been growing ever since. The next part of that story is um, we had never ruled out doing a Chevy magazine ever. That was, we knew that was a very obviously a huge market. At the end of the day, the Chevy market's so big, you cannot ignore it. Um, and uh, interestingly, what, what, what has happened with Wheelhub is that, um, you know, in seeking out the uh, kind of the, the premier best of the best builds, the, the content over time has become focused a lot on the, the traditional hot rod and the custom market. Uh, whether you're talking, you know, 32 and later Fords or early Fords or uh, uh, the, the custom market as well. So, um, you know, just that era of cars is, is where people are spending a lot of their money. And, and so, interestingly, as you, you flip through all the back issues of Wheel Hub, you'll see, yeah, there are, you, we do have the occasional 69 Camaro. Um, and the occasional mid-year Corvette, but there's such a large core of that market that does not get covered in wheel hub. And it's no, nothing deliberate or intentional. Uh, we're, we're just following um, the best of the best builds. So if those happen to be Chevys, we're gonna follow, we're gonna cover them. But uh, again, it just, it just so happens that uh, a lot of those upper echelon builds happen to be uh, hot rods and customs, and there are not a lot of Chevys in that space. So that kind of factored into our decision as well. It's like, hey, you know, we've um, uh, it, it's just kind of turned out to where we're not doing any, we're not in the Chevy space. 
And we're not covering that many of them or as, as many as we thought we would in Wheel Hub. Uh, so after we did two issues of Mustang Hub and Henry had made that transition and, and, and uh, he was pretty comfortable with what the, um, with what the workflow was like. He was all, hey, why, what do you think about doing a Chevy magazine now? And so uh, at that point, we were then coming up on, you know, late 2020. So, so Mustang Hub launched um, around June of that year. And by December, we had already started working on Chevy Hub. And so that, that premiere issue launched uh, January of this year, so January 2021. So you are growing. I mean, it, it seems like picking up momentum, you know, that that combined with the quality of the product that you produce <laughs> requires a lot of time and effort. How do you sure. how do you balance work, family, all of the other things that like being a human who has to sleep and, and things <laughs> like that? How do you balance it all? Oh, you just you just need it right there. That's the key is you don't sleep. <laughs> so so the, uh, it, I'll, I'll just put it like this. It, it's um, there's really no way around the fact that the if you want it to work, you, you got to start small. I mean, I mean, it's that's the only way it works. It's if you compare how how the resources that we have and the number of people we have working on each of our titles or collectively compared to the way things used to be done with big publishing companies, everyone's got to wear about a dozen different hats or more. I mean, really, we live in Truck Hub. We've got three guys. It's me, Robert and uh, Rodney, that's it. And really that's the only way it works. Whereas in the past, a magazine can support a staff of two, three dozen people. It's not the case anymore. I mean, you, you try to have that kind of uh, manpower and overhead these days, it's just not gonna work. So um, you have to be able to do it lean and mean. That's the only way it works. But that's the case with any small business. Any small business is whoever is involved the owners involved, you're going to wear a lot of different hats and you're going to work some really long hours. There's that old adage, do what you love and you won't work a day in your life. Right. Um, yeah, that can kind of bite you in the ass because you are going to be working a lot more than you would if you're going to be, you know, for somebody else. You're going to have to, like Stephen said, we all have to wear many, many hats to get everything out the door. Um, Stephen actually does a lot of the, the brunt work um, cause he's fulfillment, he's business management, he's editor, he's publisher. Um, and so, and Rodney has to wear a lot of hats cause he's, you know, he has to lay everything out. He has to, you know, design the look of the books, our logos, our displays. Um, and, you know, I do a fair amount of, you know, you know, sourcing content and talking to shops and traveling around and getting the cart work done and, finding freelancers to help us out when we need it. Um, but when you're passionate about it and you, it, the hours don't matter, you know, um, I would, for example, I mean, I left my house Monday night and I had to drive down to Illinois to work on a story with, um, that was time sensitive. Um, we're working on a story right now with rad rides. They have, um, are building or Troy built a, uh, flathead Ford for customer last year and it broke the natural aspirated record at Bonneville last year. So they've gone through the motor, redid it, and they're trying for a different class. And the stuff that they had, the, all the, the technology and stuff they had to put into that engine to make it do what it's supposed to do that everybody said it wouldn't work. So um, I had to go down and shoot the engine in the morning at the builders and then go down in the afternoon and get the final assembled engine later that day, plus I shot a, a follow-up story we're doing with them on that 41 that we had in Bear Steel a couple of issues ago. So I didn't get home till one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so it's just, just how it is, you know? And, and you just, it doesn't come easy. It doesn't come free. It doesn't come quick, but you know, it's, it's hard to paying the dues and part of getting everything together. And um, I've been way happier in my career and and home life reflects on that, you know, if you're happy doing what you're doing, then everything else kind of falls into place. Um, going back a little bit too, what was funny when we started putting out the betas and 
we started talking to different shops and um, the number one question we got was, so it's just the three of you? And, you know, it's just like, nobody still, I mean, I still have people question whether or not we have additional help behind the scenes. And it's like, nope, this is it. Just the three of yeah. us. Well, yeah, yeah. And it's uh, not just manpower. Like Robert mentioned, you know, the manpower side. So yeah, we, we still have conversations to this day where people ask us like who else is involved or uh, we don't get asked as quite as many, much as we used to, but especially early on, everyone wanted to know, well, uh, who's your investor? Like who, who's the money guy? And to us like, well, that's us. There is no investor. I mean, you know, just to be brutally honest, you think about when we started this, and uh, it probably wouldn't be too different today, is you'd have to be one hell of a salesman to get anyone to invest in a print magazine. It's like, you know, Rodney likes to, it's like trying to get someone to uh, put money into AM radio. It, it's, it's just seen as such an antiquated product by so many people. And most of the time when people try to uh, start their, their own publishing ventures, it, it ends in tears. You know, there, you can't even count on, you know, 10 sets of hands, the, the amount of titles that have propped up that have just, uh, start, just aren't around anymore. So I don't see how you could get anyone to invest in that in the first place. And we're certainly not good enough salesmen to do it. So, but it's, um, it's worked out great. Now we're in a position where um, we wouldn't take one on even if someone wanted to come in and we don't really need to answer to anyone. The only people we answer to are the readers and our, our advertisers and anyone else who, who works with us. Let's say, you know, we, we just feel like, you know what? Um, we've been at 164 pages for a long time and, you know, we're doing well. We've had some more ads come in. You know, the, the editorial is feeling kind of cramped. Well, let's pick it up to 180 pages. You know, we, we just decide amongst ourselves, okay, let's do it. Or going from 100 to 196 pages, or we want to upgrade the packaging. We're sending out our magazines that, okay, no question. We don't, nothing we do requires approval from 12 layers of management. We just do it. So the Speedway Motors Museum of mm -hmm. American Speed is being featured in the summer issue, which is coming out yes. soon. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we're, we're honored, you know, we're honored to be in, in the pages of Wheel Hub. How did that, how did that come about? How did that feature land on your, your plates? So, so Tim, um, just out of nowhere, one day he, he buys some copies of Wheel Hub and he subscribes. And I think maybe even prior to that, Clay had been by our booth in Pomona and signed up. And so, you know, we knew, uh, and that was probably a year or so prior to any of this coming together. So, you know, that, that was, I think at that point, they were becoming familiar with their product and what we were all about. And from there, um, I can't remember if we pitched the story to them or they pitched it to us. But I think, I think we were talking to Jason and they invited mm -hmm. us to the museum and then, oh, okay. And then okay, that's uh, right. do a story on it from there. Yeah, so we were familiar with the museum. We'd seen some bits and pieces of it. We'd seen some YouTube videos and I always want to check it out. So it, it, to us, that's a no brainer. That, that's just cool stuff that any car guy would want to see. And we just felt like, hey, we think it's cool. We think everyone should check this place out. Let's, let's let people know about it and show it off. So that's how that came together. Oh, we're, we're glad you did. I can't wait to see the I can't wait to see it in print again. You know, you look at we look at these museum images, and mm -hmm. you know, Jason Lubkin that you you were talking about uh, is there. I think his title is media specialist or something like mm -hmm. that. He's also a darn good photographer, so he oh, takes yeah. these really dramatic photos mm -hmm. of these cars in the museum. But again, there's something different about seeing it in print than it is than seeing it in on a screen. And, sure. and I'm pretty excited to see it. And I think that really, you know, you're talking about how print is like AM radio. Mm -hmm. There's there's never, you're never going to lose this idea that seeing your car in print, this car that you've sweat mm -hmm. blood for five years to build, mm -hmm. and then seeing it in a magazine, that's always going to be different than seeing it on a computer screen, I think. Oh, for yeah, sure. it's no doubt. I mean, I've had situations before, um, when I was freelancing for all the Motor Trend books, I've had a couple of assignments that were web only. And 
you go to the shoot, you line up the time with the guy, you meet him with the car and, and he's, oh, when's this going to be in? And I was like, well, it's going to be on online. And now all of a sudden he's looking at his watch trying to, when can I meet my friends for dinner? I got to get out. You know, they just, yeah. it, it's a totally different experience. Um, and you can totally see the change in somebody when they think it's going to go to print. And then you tell to tell them that, no, this is what I was assigned to do. And they get completely deflated. Now, I mean, there is a place to have stuff up on the internet, but you know, and it's exciting. I mean, for a guy who may get his car on the, there some influencer might get a million views on his car and that's great. It, you know, that lasts what, 15 minutes mm -hmm. tops. And then, you know, our book, the, way we designed it is you know it's not a type of a magazine where you're going to look at it a couple of times and throw it in the bin it's you know it's something you're going to put on your shelf and or on your coffee table you're going to be out and you're going to share it with other people so it's getting more than just a couple of views it's getting probably you know dozens if not hundreds of views mm -hmm. um i've talked to many people that have had subscribers and readers and um even some of the builders that we work at, they'll go back and reread stuff or relook at stuff all the time. So it's, it's, it's doing what we had hoped it would do. Yeah. I, I have on the shelf behind me a bunch, you know, decades worth of old hot rod magazines and, mm -hmm. and just car magazines, you know, and you, you go back to them and you're afraid, you know, this is where the cook and bedwell dragster was on the cover of this issue of hot rod. Sure. And I want to look at it because there's a piece of information there. Where Do you guys think about, the way that your magazine is going to age? Like, do you think about what happens if it sits on the shelf for 10, 20 years? Is that something that's even a thought? Yeah, actually it is. I mean, the, uh, not, not all the time, but you know, I like to joke around when, uh, you know, when, when the dust settles from World War III and all you have running around are cockroaches, people can still pick up a copy of Wheel Hub. You know, so, uh, so yeah, I don't, you know, don't think about it too often, but every now and then, and, and that is pretty cool that it's not just going to disappear because, you know, interestingly, you know, there are, um, you know, Robert's been through this as well. You know, we, we might uh, try to look up some, a, a specific story that we've done that we know at one time was online, but you either can't find it because there's so much other stuff that pops up or it's been taken down. Other interesting thing, um, in terms of the, uh, the the AM radio analogy, is is on one hand you can look at it as a uh, the, the same technology that killed print, whether that's digital cameras or, or uh, the internet or social media or, or whatever. Let's just call it digital. I mean that that's often attributed to what killed print. In, in a way, that's what's helping bring it back. Like for us, there's no way we can do our jobs. Well, look at us now. We're, we're having a, a Zoom call in a podcast. Or what, me, Robert, and Ronnie, we're always communicating on our phones, email, text. We're putting up our content on FTP servers. Robert's, you know, among millions of photographers who've been shooting the digital for over a decade now. We're, we're file sharing on FTP sites. Um, we're doing proofs through email. I mean, there's no way not any of that was possible uh, you know, before the digital revolution. You know, there was, we would all have to have been uh, renting an office building and gathering the same place at the same time. Um, I would have to, to get a magazine out. <laughs> um, but now we don't have to. And it's because of the digital tools at our disposal. So um, you know, to, to me, I, I find that very interesting. And it's funny because you see a lot of that in different genres too, because you look at um, how digital has changed the landscape of music, but yet now you have a big resurgence of vinyl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, look at Jack White. He has a whole record pressing plant in Tennessee now. You know, he's re, re cataloging all the white stripes, all the rock and tours, and he's starting to repress albums for different companies now. And then you have, you know, a lot of photographers out there in the world who are now going and, you know, there's a couple of guys that I follow on YouTube that are shoot eight by 10 or, or just shoot film. And mm -hmm. because of digital, they've gone back and slowed that process down. And, and I think there's, you know, it's the same thing with like what Steven's saying with the magazines. I think people, there's a place for everything, but I think there is still that really desire and need to have something tactile that you can look at and, I mean, honestly, I've, 
I've always, I mean, I'm 53 years old, so I'm going to be an old school guy at this, but I, I never really embraced looking at stories or stuff on my computer or sitting on my phone. Um, Cause if I, if I see a car picture on the phone, it's, you know, how, you know, the largest, our largest iPhone is what, six, eight inches. Whereas, you know, our two page spread is 20 inches. So mm -hmm. um, I'd rather see it in large. And, and I think that's what, and you can see more detail and you don't have to like strain your eye to, you know, there's to gestures on your phone to get the larger and you can only see so much of it because it's so down res to get it on the internet in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just interesting how the surge of digital has, has for seemed to like ruin some businesses or some mm -hmm. industries, but it's also like brought people back to a simpler so, I mean, I guess we're, we're sort of talking about the future here. What, mm -hmm. what is your dream for the next, the next phase? What do you, what do you guys see this going? Uh, that, that's a really good question. I mean, for, for, for now, uh, I think we did expand it so much in the last year. It's hard for me to think about that. You know, I just want to get, <laughs> uh, just want to get a, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the three new titles really get them to where we all is at. Uh, you know, production-wise and quality-wise, they're already there. It, it's just a matter of uh, you know, getting each to the point of critical mass where you know, as, a, as a business and as the dollars and cents go, they're, they're working how we want them to work. And, and you know, we, we made a tremendous amount of progress in the short amount of time. I, you know, I think beyond that, um, We'd like to expand the product behind just a paper products, you know, and uh, uh, you know, they're, I think we're quite a, quite a bit, quite a ways away from uh, exploring, you know, some of the other uh, potential avenues to do that. Uh, but you know, I, I guess that's that's a big but a succinct way to say it. Just figure out ways to expand the. Uh, Wheel Hub, Truck Hub, Chevy Hub, and Mustang Hub is beyond a paper product. You know, to, to, to something that leverages off the brand and make it more, uh, make it more of, of a, a lifestyle brand where, where people can enjoy, not just when it shows up in your mailbox every quarter, but uh, more consistently throughout the year. You talk about Wheel Hub, you know, having mm. 20 pages on a car as being the next mm. best thing to actually mm. sitting in the car. How do how do you translate that to digital? Do you have ideas, or are you not sharing them? Um, no, that's that's a good question. I, I think you know it, it, it's. You know, I think what we've done really well is uh, you know we know what we're good at, but we also are keenly aware of what we can be doing better at. And now I am you know we we uh, we're as active as we can be on social, but. You know, we can certainly have more digital content. Like Robert, right now, he's doing some really cool videos, he's putting up on social and YouTube. I like to see that grow. And it's a different approach from how it's usually done. We're not doing it in a way where, hey, we want to have so many subscribers and followers to where we want to try to monetize this. It's, it's really not that at all. If we can, that's great. It's just, it's more to have a uh, extension of the brand or a, an experience that's different from the magazine because, uh, Yes, I, I, I still think, um, you know, a 20 page feature is, is the next best thing to own the car and turn the key. But you know what, it is cool to see it uh, doing a burnout or passing by it wide up a throttle or, or uh, you know, get, getting some, uh, you know, cool angles with or, or action footage that, that's difficult to do with it still. So uh, again, that, that's something we can, we are doing a little bit of that, but we can certainly do more of it and do a better job. Uh, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, uh, it's like anything else when you're small. It, it's just prioritizing where you allocate your resources. So um, in time, we will expand that. We're slowly doing it, but that, that's certainly an area uh, where we know we can, we can be doing more. Is there anything else that you guys want to mention um, any anything that you think is important given given all that we've discussed here um for me it's mainly just to uh just to put out there you know how, how humbled we are by everyone who's gotten behind us and how appreciative we are whether it's readers or every single one of, of our sponsors or 
any of the shops that we've worked with or manufacturers. They've all been so incredibly supportive. Not, none of this is possible without them. So between them, um, you know, the uh, uh, Robert and Rodney and Henry, who we all work with very closely, and uh, obviously um, the support we get at home, you know, for, for, from our families uh, putting up with us. So, uh, so without them, none of, without, you remove one of those pieces from the puzzle and none of it works. Yeah, and we're very appreciative of the time that you know, like Speedway would give us to be able to talk about our brand a little bit more. Um, yeah, definitely the support at home has always been huge for me. Um, and just of our, the partnerships we've had in, in with the manufacturers and different shops and stuff. I mean, without them, I mean, we wouldn't have anything to really put on the pages. So um, we're really blessed to have a great group of people that we work with on a regular basis. And we're always, and it's, and the new friendships and the new, and the new places we get to work with. Um, like for me personally, I, it's been fun having like, as my, as Rodney would say it, not having guardrails because I'm the type of person who likes just about anything and getting the opportunities to shoot different vehicles that I normally probably wouldn't shoot or have the opportunity to be around um, has been really great too on a personal level. But um, our families have been very, have been very supportive of our, our little adventure here. And I don't really see anything slowing that down anytime soon. Thanks to Stephen Kim and Robert McGaffin for being our guests today, and thanks to all of you for listening to What Moves You, a Speedway Motors podcast. To see photos and watch videos we referenced in today's episode, visit the toolbox at speedwaymotors.com. Email the podcast at podcast at speedwaymotors.com, and if you like what you heard, tell a friend where to find us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks.